Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. In today's podcast, I'm going to examine one of the most common claims of Aikido, that it comes from battlefield techniques used by the samurai and the weapon combat that they employed. This is a caricature which is partially true, but as with most things, it's complicated. Let's dig into it. The image of Aikido which has been painted for us is that Aikido is the empty hand version of the battlefield arts of ancient Japan. The movements, positions, attacks, and evasions all come from those used when wielding the sword or the spear. I don't think one can merely say, yes, this is true, or no, it isn't. To start out with, let's take a step back and view the history of warfare of Japan. First thing to realize is that the samurai were the warrior class. Almost all cultures had some class of warriors within it, and the Japanese culture had a pretty unique take on their warrior class. Samurai held military power, and to keep this power in check, samurai were not allowed to own land. This is in stark contrast to the nobility class in Europe, for example, where an earl, baron, or knight would be a landholder and duty-bound to keep a certain number of troops trained and active for duty at all times. The history of the samurai is that they were archers, not swordsmen. The nature and development of Japanese warfare was quite a bit different from the rest of the world. A main reason was that they were an isolated island nation. They had no sea navigation skills, so although they used ships, those ships never fared out of sight of land until navigation was introduced to them after the era of the samurai had largely passed. There were only two significant invasions of Japan by foreign armies in ancient and medieval times. Both were by the Mongols, and both encountered huge typhoons which all but destroyed their fleets before any significant numbers of troops could get ashore. These typhoons gave rise to the kamikaze, or divine wind. The Japanese felt that these storms were from the gods who protected their island from invaders. So what does this have to do with the development of Japanese warfare? A great deal. Whenever you face an opposing army, you develop your tactics, strategies, weapons, and equipment to more effectively protect yourself and effectively deal with them. Innovations must be developed which give your side an advantage. In Japan's case, they really only ever battled one another, at least until they started invading China and Russia, but this was after the samurai era was long gone. We're talking about the era of sword combat on the ancient and medieval battlefields. Did the Japanese stay at the forefront of weapon and warfare technology as they went along? I think it's fair to say they did well in some areas and poorly in others. One thing which stands out to me as I look at Japan's history of warfare was the weaponry itself. Swords and archery were very common among most all cultures for millennia, and Japan was no exception. However, their most common weapon choices overlooked some pretty important ones, those being axes, maces, heavy halberds, and probably the most notable one, the shield. There are some examples of Japanese weapons which could be equated to what I list here, such as the kanabo, or the studded club. These were not commonplace weapons and were fairly rare. The main weapons of the samurai were the bow, the sword, the spear, and the naginata, or polearm. The reason I think the shield was a conspicuous omission was how many cultures throughout the world used some kind of shield. To be fair, the Japanese did use war fans on occasion in the offhand to block blows. These fans were often metal or heavy enough wood that they wouldn't get cut in half by a sword. They were more of an accessory for an officer-class samurai than carried in the rank-and-file soldiers like you would see in a Viking shield wall, for example. It is commonly said of the samurai that they were all about attacking and defense was not really a consideration. Therefore, why bother with a shield? The answer to that is simple, and that is that a shield makes for a terrifying weapon. Depending on the configuration of the shield, it can not only be a splendid device for protecting the user, but can do far more damage than a sword. A shield really is a marvel. It just doesn't have 50 plus years of being romanticized in the movies going for it. Underestimate the power of the shield in combat and warfare at your peril. The Japanese were not entirely ignorant of the protective benefits of the shield, though. They used a type of shield called a pavis, that is, a tall shield which is set on the ground with legs to prop it up. Archers or gunners would hide behind them to reload and then fire over or around them to attack. They were more portable walls than shields as you would imagine a European knight wielding. Consider for well over 2,000 years using a shield for hand-to-hand -hand combat either never occurred to the Japanese or it occurred to them and they dismissed the idea. Now I don't know which one's true, but the Japanese are clever and industrious. I rather doubt that it never occurred to them for soldiers to use portable shields to fight with. 
the Japanese do have a strong culture of honor and personal prestige. There are many accounts in battles, samurai seeking out rival samurai of equal or slightly higher station to fight. They would announce their names and family in a kind of introduction. All of this in a full-scale battle. It seems rather out of place when the goal is to prevail over the enemy. If your mind is on gaining prestige in battle, would it seem cowardly to carry a shield into combat? Perhaps so. On the other hand, wouldn't it be cowardly to sit back and shoot an opponent from a distance instead of engaging him in close-range sword combat? It's not easy to dive into the mind of the samurai of that era. They had a very unique culture, which has been largely romanticized and distorted from what it really was. That brings us to the lineage factor. One main point of differentiation that the Japanese martial arts have is a living lineage. They have a martial art which has been taught from teacher to student down through generations from medieval times. Most other cultures do not have this. Their hand-to-hand -hand arts have been lost to time as they embrace new warfare technologies. The firearm is the primary influence for this change. A few within the Japanese culture tried very hard to keep their martial traditions alive through passing it down to further generations. Some succeeded, and others died off. An example of one which survived is Katori Shintaru, which is a sword and weapon-based art and is still around today. Other arts have evolved into sport applications such as kendo. Just like western fencing, the sport has evolved so far past its historical roots that it is very different from what it was long ago. How does this fit into the picture with Aikido? There is more than a little dispute about Osensei and his sword work. There is no documentation that he was an official instructor or even practitioner of a particular sword rue. The rumor is that he studied sword, but there really is no definitive evidence that this assertion is true. Those who have solid background and training in sword rue will point out glaring issues with things Osensei shows in his films. These criticisms seem to have merit and are worth considering. That's the sword, but what about the empty handwork? This is where things get pretty foggy. A fact most agree on is that Osensei was a Daito Ru Aiki Jiu Jitsu instructor. He had a teaching certificate signed by Sukaku Takeda to establish that. It is also widely accepted that Morahai did not train directly with Sukaku for many years. It was a few years, then they became estranged. Even in those few years, it wasn't like Morahai was an Uchideshi or live in student. I do wonder just how much talent and experience Morahai came to Sakaku with already. He was a young man when they met, and he did practice sumo like many young Japanese men did in that era. But to pick up an art in just a few years, well enough to teach it, seems curious. Maybe Morahai was just that talented. Daituru Aiki Jiu Jitsu is a fairly complicated art, so I give him a lot of credit for being able to learn what most could not in that short time. If we now look at Sakaku Takeda, there is some dispute as to whether what he taught was something he learned, or he was another talented individual who made up his art. I've heard both of these assertions, and I'm just not sure what to make of them exactly. I think the idea that Sakaku entirely contrived of Daituru Aiki Jiu Jitsu himself seems like a stretch to me. If he did, it had to be one of the most comprehensive scams in martial art history. Considering the thousands of techniques in the curriculum, Someone making all that up is a truly epic undertaking. It is worth noting if there is a gap in the living lineage, though. As I understand it, Sukaku was born of a peasant family and was adopted into a samurai family. He was not even a teenager when the Reformation and the samurai uprising in Japan happened. I heard that he wanted to be raised into the samurai ways. And who wouldn't prefer that over being a peasant, particularly in Japan where changing classes was almost unheard of. His foster family was associated with the Samurai Rebellion, as I understand it, and most of those who would have trained him, or started training him, were either killed or committed seppuku when the rebellion failed. He would have as well, but he was too young. So, he was caught in a gap in history. Caveat, I'm no scholar on Sakaku Takeda. There are things which I have gleaned over the years of listening to others and reading what I could about him. It is tricky because some stuff is romantic and distorted, and other information seems more real and down-to-earth. If someone has more insight into this history, please drop a comment. Whether or not a living lineage for Daito-ru Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, and therefore Aikido, can be established is rather beside the point. Both arts clearly have their practical techniques. I feel some are a bit more complex than necessary, but the fundamental techniques are practical and were used throughout history and cultures across the world. As Bruce Lee commented, human bodies are pretty much the same everywhere. This means hand-to-hand -hand combat across time and cultures will have similarities. 
The technique names might be different, but they will largely be the same thing. The variations will be relatively minor, with any major ones having to do with the environment. A great example is Wing Chun, which is a small and tight art designed for the narrow streets of Chinese urban areas. Another is Savat, which was designed to be effective on board a wet ship deck, which may be curved and pitching back and forth. Getting back to Aikido, warriors, soldiers, and fighters have been throwing people to the ground for millennia. I rather doubt someone, whether it was Morahai or Sakaku, who suddenly came up with a new way to do this that no one had before. In all likelihood, they observed, learned, and innovated what they saw into their arts. I believe that there is nothing new under the sun when it comes to hand-to-hand -hand combat. If there's something you came up with, it's been done before. It's just that you may not have seen it or been taught it. Credit to you for discovering it, but really you are only rediscovering it. If it works, it works. Does it really matter if it came from an ancient battlefield or not? Chances are it probably did. Does it matter which country's battlefield it came from? To me, it doesn't. I've found great value in studying combat from many cultures. There was a time when I was really into Japanese culture and their warfare. I still respect it, but I also appreciate that their ancient warfare was not really exposed to other cultures. This means it did not have all the dimensions other armies and warrior cultures had. I don't think that there was any one culture which could claim being the best. They all had their strengths and weaknesses. I just think that Japan was a little too isolated, and it did not benefit as much as other cultures did in terms of the development of their military and warfare technology. That doesn't mean I don't love Aikido, because I do. In many ways, I believe it is the best platform to establish a martial skill base from. It does what many other arts do not. Lineage doesn't matter in this regard. In fact, as I've learned and studied other arts, particularly historical arts, I see many parallels in the stable posture, stance, and footwork of Aikido. Simplicity is the key to effectiveness, and this is reflected in many historical arts of many cultures. I'll leave you with a video to check out. It is of samurai reenactors in Japan who are fighting in armor. They are using presumably rebated weapons for safety, but are using full throws which you can see in one-on-one -on -one combat about 17 seconds into the video. Although this is a reenactment and no one is really getting killed, this is an excellent example of what the martial heritage of Aikido looked like. Does it look like what you see in modern Aikido demonstrations? Is this similar to what your training on the mat looks like? Give these questions some thought before making the claim that Aikido is like martial arts from the ancient Japanese battlefield. What do you think? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube, or go to the Facebook group Aikido the Martial Side and post a comment. The Spirit Aikido online program is now live. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. There is a link in the description section. I invite you to check it out. I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.